here. But ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, Mr. Don Stanley. Hey, thank you very much. Let me just quick pull up my presentation. Um, and let's give a hand again to the folks of Social Media Breakfast for putting something like this together where we get to have a room full of people who understand what it is that we're doing and working with. Great chance to collaborate, so a hand for the folks from Social Media Breakfast. Sorry, I like audience participation. So, let's start out with this, because you're not really here for me, you're here for you, right? Some of you will say, yeah, I came to hear you speak, but the reality is, you're just like with social, you're not here for me, you're for yourself. So I want you to imagine this. Imagine it is December 15th, you're working for a business, and your boss comes to you and says, I've got a, I got a deal for you. Boss comes and, and says, here's what I'm gonna do for you. I'm gonna give you a $3 million budget. The $3 million budget is going to be used for digital and content marketing. By the way, this is a true story, only the names and places have been changed to protect the innocent, okay? And what I want you to do is I want you to come up with a digital marketing plan for us and I want you to get us out there. So, Shane, you're the lucky winner of this $3 million, what do you do? Uh, he's speechless. <laughs> hire me, hire me is what you need to do. Roy, what about you, what do you do? Uh, this, this is a, a, we need more coffee at these tables as well. Who, who, who has an answer that they want to share? Publish all my children's books simultaneously. Jill, what would you do? Ah, it depends on the priorities and organizations and goals, but market research, anything else? Hit, hit the college. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Okay. Well, what this organization did is they hired an ad agency to create epic content. All right, because we all hear that content is king. Create epic content. And so, at the six-month mark, June thirtieth, boss comes in and says, "How are things going?" He said, "Well, you know, this this is this takes work. You know, doing doing digital marketing, social media, it takes work." And we, we haven't seen an increase in traffic yet. We haven't really seen an increase in sharing of our content on social, uh, digital, and we haven't seen any increase in sales. Three million dollars, okay? So your boss says, all right, I want you to fire the first team. I'm gonna give you six more months. You've got 1.5 million dollars to spend in the next six months. Go for it. Create more epic content. Continue to spit out epic content and we want to get on the map because we've heard everywhere that creating epic content is what this is all about, right? Right, nodding is a universal sign of acknowledgement? Yep, all right. And so December 15th comes, nearing the end of the year, boss says, all right, I'm ready, I'm excited. CMO, CMO Shane, you set this thing up, you didn't hire this guy down so you made a mistake, but we'll forgive you. And uh, what are the results? Results are $3 million budget, $3 million worth of content, no increase in traffic, no increase of shares, no increase of sales. And you know what happens? He gets mad and you get fired, all right? And this is a case that's starting to happen more and more and more. Now, I love digital marketing, social media marketing, content marketing. I work, I do work with the Content Marketing Institute. I write, I've done classes for them. I write stuff for them. I love content. But the reality is we have to figure out what's happening. Has anybody had this happen with them where you're creating content and you're not seeing a lot of traffic? Show of hands. Okay, just a few of you. The rest of you are lying. But that's all right. That's all right. I still love you. Um, why is this becoming more common? The reason it's becoming more common is this idea of content shock. Has anybody heard the term content shock? Okay, so content shock basically says that content's being created at such a fast pace and there's so much available that there's a limited capacity for us to consume because you know what? Believe it or not, we all need sleep. It's, I don't know about you, but it's, it's kind of you know, one of those human biological things where you actually need sleep. 
And so what happens is as more content gets out there, there's more noise. And for us to be able to stand out, and this is where social media, you're gonna find it's a great solution and a great help for this, is we have to figure out how do we stand out? When, like in my space, I'm a partner with HubSpot. Has anybody heard of HubSpot before? How am I gonna compete with HubSpot? No way, I can't. So I have to figure out some different strategies. Now, just a little bit of quick background on me. This is me. Anybody ever see the movie Up? Squirrel! Now, part of what I'm lucky enough to do with teaching at the university and also running my own business is that I like to explore a lot of things. So I might not be super deep in terms of knowledge. I mean, that's what I love about like last month with the podcast and Andrew Foxwell when he talked about Facebook ads is you get to go deep. I look, like to look at the whole field. And I, I also study uh, neuroscience and psychology to figure out, well, why do we use these tools? What do we use them for? What makes us engage and interact with them? And so one of the things that I like to do is I like to do lots of different things. And here's a small sampling of some of my clients. You may have heard of some of them. I'm not sure if you've heard of a few of them. But I'm lucky enough to work with some pretty cool organizations, get, get a chance to do some pretty cool work. It's a lot of fun. I also work with a lot of small nonprofits and small businesses. But these ones most people recognize, so they're like, wow, that's impressive. And you're supposed to impress people so that they pay attention. That's credibility and social proof, by the way, which is important in social media. All right, and so one of the gigs that I have right now is how many people here are familiar with Mark Schaefer? Oh my goodness, wow. Okay, gotta check out Mark Schaefer. Businessesgrow.com is one of the top 10 blogs in the world, the business blogs in the world, consistently listed as one of the top uh, social media and digital marketing influencers by Forbes, and he writes for Forbes, and Harvard, oh, he's writing for Harvard Business Review, excuse me, a bunch of other places like that goes around the world speaking, does lots of cool stuff. And anyway, he wrote this book, The Content Code, which created a lot of, uh, or initially called it The Content Shock, created a lot of, of um, feedback. There was about 800 plus blog posts, and not including videos, podcasts, etc., written about this idea that we're getting saturated with content. And the feedback from a lot of people was this is BS. This is BS, this stuff isn't happening. We're all you know, able to uh, consume content and there's not a problem with our content being found. And Mark is very detached with his research, which is one of the reasons that I really love working with him. I get really emotional and attached to things and he's able to look at stuff logically and saying, okay, if you step back, take yourself out of being a content marketer and a social media person and think about what it's like in terms of what you consume. Is there anybody in this room who has too little content in their life? Anyone? Anyone who feels like they have too much free time on their hands? No? Darn, I still want to trade lives with somebody at some point. And so the idea is that when you look at these things, what is it that we as marketers can start to do to fight this idea of content shock? So part of my job right now, uh, working in, in a consulting role with Mark, is to figure out and look at, I'm getting to look at, I feel like a mad scientist, looking at all these super cool tools to figure out, how, how do we get people to pay, a con not just attention to content, but how do we build audience and how do we build traction so that our content moves? So the one thing that I want to qualify to, does anybody know what this is? Anyone? Okay. This is what I sell, and this is what any good marketer should sell, is crockpots versus microwaves. Building good plans, and this is why the, the company that I mentioned before was given 12 months, is it takes time to build quality relationships. There is no easy button. I don't care what any, if anybody is selling an easy button in here, you're wrong because you can have, and I, I, I jokingly say, you can have your one night stands, but you very rarely will marry somebody like that because good relationships take time to build connections and it's the same in business. And the cool thing with the psychology and neuroscience of studying this stuff is we, the, the pathways in our brain that develop when we form good close friendships can form with businesses and organizations and they can happen when we start to use digital effectively and well. And so Jay Bear actually echoes this as well. So for those of you who can't see, I know you're not supposed to read from slides, but I'll just, I'll just say, content success is as much about amplification as it is about creating, and it's not easy. So one of the things that we used to have was this idea of, okay, how do we stand out? And just really quick history lesson, we had these three quick phases. First one was building websites. Everybody remember 1995, 1996? Oh, the glory days. 20, that was only 20 years ago. 
And as you get older, 20 years is a smaller amount of time, by the way. Uh, all my students are like, 20 years ago, that's like black and white TVs, wasn't it? And I'm like, shut up. I don't want to talk about that. Let's change something. But it was, okay, if you wanted to stand out, what did you do? You built a website. Then a couple years later, it became, well, there's so many websites, we've got this little tool now called Google. We need to be found in search because what people are doing is they're going to the light of all, the source of all light, truth, and knowledge, Google, and they're doing a quick search. And whoever shows up first wins, right? How many people consistently go past the first, how many people consistently use Google? How many people consistently go past the first or second page of search results? Okay, there's a therapist in the back that will talk to you afterwards. <laughs> Getting up there. But the idea is we don't because we expect Google to provide these search results. Well, now as this marketplace is getting more crowded, the competition for those top 10 spots is getting tougher and tougher and tougher, right? Trying to gain the system, trying to use just SEO. It doesn't work anymore. So now we've got social and mobile. All right, now I'm gonna stand out. Now if I can plant my flag, get here before my competition does, I'm good, right? What's the problem now? Everybody's on social and mobile, and social and mobile is becoming increasingly fragmented. How many people three years ago were on Snapchat? One, Snapchat didn't even exist then. <laughs> How many people were on Meerkat two years ago? Periscope, we weren't, right? Because it didn't exist. Think of what's happened in the 11 years. Facebook is 11 years old, and think of what's happened in terms of how we market and how we consume content. It's crazy. And so we try to gain this and figure this out, and now what we've got is we've got this explosion of content that there's so much out there that people are like, squirrel, and look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, when they're looking at their news feed or their Instagram, whatever it is. And so again, the idea is we have to think strategically about how we stand out. One thing to pay attention to, whether or we not we like this, this is true. By the year 2020, it is estimated that data will increase 500%. Data online will increase 500%. That means we will have five internets, the equivalent of five more internets of what we have today. Think about that from a marketing perspective. Is that exciting news? It's like, oh man, are you kidding me? How am I gonna stand out? And what's even more interesting, to me, is 75% of that content is gonna be created by you guys, right? And why do we go on social? Does anybody go on and say, hey, I want more branding? You know, I've got three younger kids and I've never once had them say, Dad, can you read some advertising to me before I go to bed? That would be so cool. You know, no, what they wanna hear is why do we go on social? For the most part, a lot of times we go on to connect to find information or to connect with friends. So it's gonna be harder for businesses and organizations to stand out when you're thinking of a stream of content coming from who? Your friends and family, right? So we need to be cognizant of this. And you can see this with Facebook reach. I wish Andrew was here. But Facebook reach, 2011 organic Facebook reach, 26% of your content would get through. What is it today, 2015, anybody know? Organic reach on Facebook? It's bad. That's, that's the official, official number, bad. So this number is decreasing, and so again, we have to think about things. The average person at any one moment when they go onto Facebook, Facebook has the option of showing them 1,500 pieces of content. That's why Facebook filters. And if you look at a person's Facebook feed, you'll see a psychological profile of who they are, what they curate, it's very, very interesting. It's about, my kids hate that I know this stuff because they're like, Dad, quit looking at my stuff. But the idea, again, 1,500 pieces of content, massive content. So how do we stand out amongst all this noise? And that's really one of the big questions that we have to consider. And what's interesting is when Mark wrote the original Content Shock blog post last year in January 2014, tons of organizations, big organizations, organizations that I work with, like, no, 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 he's wrong, doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, if you look in the last month and a half, two months since this book came out and since he gave his keynote at South by Southwest, you're seeing lots of uh, email newsletters saying, here's how to amplify your content. There's actually job descriptions for content ignition and amplification specialists. So it's kind of that, you know, kicking and screaming at first, but then saying, oh, maybe there's some truth to this. And so we need to think about, well, what do we do to stand out? Because a big part of our job, how many people in here are responsible for doing some type of content curation or content creation for their business, for their clients, all right? So it used to be that that was the finish line. Now we have to start thinking about that's, doing great content is like the, the bar that we have to all meet. 
to stand out. And now we need to start thinking about igniting what we create. So creating it is one component. Derek Halperin, does anybody know Derek Halperin from Social Triggers? One person? Oh man, I wish you, you guys all have to take my class. Um, Derek Halpern has some great stuff, and he says 20% of your time should be spent on content creation, 80% should, should be spent on amplifying and sharing. Which is exciting because people who work in social, that's what we know how to do, which means job security, which is really cool. So, as I mentioned, this is just the, the starting line is the great content. It is, it is no longer the finish line. And, and sometimes, you know, I like to think, whew, I completed something. I, I got a blog post done, I created a video. Ah, but again, that's just the starting point. And what I'm finding from a business standpoint that's exciting for people like us is that when we create, when a client or somebody creates content, now they're needing help amplifying that content. And now we have an opportunity to say, if we learn this well, we can help you get noticed and we can help you stand out. So just a couple of quick stats. 83% um, of brand marketers say social sharing is the number one benefit of digital marketing. Social sharing. Because who do we trust? Do we trust businesses and organizations? No, we trust our friends. Exactly right. So we trust our friends. 85% of you guys and me say that when other people share content, it helps us better understand stuff. So instead of reading it from a book or a book, believe it or not, or a website or watching a video, we'll ask a friend, hey, have you ever done this before? Hey, I'm building a tree house for my kids. What should I do? Or hey, I'm thinking of, of training for a Spartan race. What do I do? Or I'm thinking of whatever. We will oftentimes reach out to our friends and it's interesting how active our friends get. I rarely put out requests for answers to questions on my Facebook feed just it just, I, I, I use Facebook for different reasons. And I did, and it was amazing the other day. Usually I don't get any comments on my stuff. Uh, I know, it's okay. Uh, but this one time I asked questions, I'd asked for feedback, it was like 50 people, bam. People like Chris Brogan, Mark Schaefer, other folks like that responded as well as local people. And it was just, uh, just unbelievable that you know, people like to share and that's uh, going into networks and getting feedback from one another is, is extremely valuable. And then 70% of people say, and this is where businesses really ears perk up, are likely to make a purchase based off of a friend's share. And we have to remember that liking something is not the same as a share. A like is a very, very, very minor, hey, I kind of like this thing. A share is saying, this is who I am and this is what I'm about. I love this nonprofit, I love this book, I love this author, I love this product so much, I am going to talk about it. And it identifies with who I am. And so this is where the psychological variables get really, really interesting. But this is where marketers perk up because they know if they can get a recommendation from someone, somebody recommends their product, their service, whatever, their organization, it's, they're gonna see much more traffic. And if the right people share, you're gonna have an even, even bigger impact. Now is this shocking news to anyone? No, it isn't, right? Because this is the way it's always been. But the challenge again is thinking about why people use social and why we use social and how much noise is out there for attention for people and how we can stand out. So the big thing to think about is that the power for businesses and brands is not through, the con not through content, it's through the content transmit mission. So getting people to move your content. BuzzSumo just did a fascinating article, if you look it up, or I can try to sh uh, find the link and share it with you, on this platform that they developed to understand how content moves in gray social and dark social. Unbelievably interesting. Huge amounts of money put into the research. And one of the questions is, it's cool, but why are they doing that? Because they know that the transmission of content, based on all of the research they've done, they analyzed over a million websites and blogs and social media channels, comes through people sharing and transmitting. Not through me creating something and saying how cool my business or organization is. It comes through people who care about my business, my organization, and me as a person sharing that with their audiences, the whole amplification idea. So you have to ask yourself, and this is an important thing, because what do businesses want to do? I want you to sell something. 
Uh, you know, I'm going to reach out to, I'm going to reach out to, you don't have a name tag, Alan. Corey. I'm going to reach out to Corey here. Corey doesn't know me very well, but you're a fitness guy, right? Okay, he's a fitness guy. I do Spartan races. I do CrossFit. So I'm gonna, I got a product. I don't know Corey very well, but I found him. He's in Madison. I'm going to go on, on social and say, hey, Corey, can you promote this for me? And what are you going to say, Corey? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> see, see, if, if I'm on the East Coast or West Coast with people, they say, no way. But Midwesterners, we're just so nice to each other. You know, it's like, maybe, yeah. No, really, what would you say? Of course. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> what about you? I'll, I'll, I'll pick on you. A absolutely not. We'll keep it for consideration. There you go. What about you? No. No. But why, why no? You have your own stuff to share. What about you? I work with him. Right? You work with him, so you have to listen to him. <laughs> what, about, what about you, Kathy? You agree with me. That's smart. Now the reason is because when you promote something that you don't know, what are you doing? You're putting your reputation on the line. Now I'm lucky enough to be friends with folks like, everybody know Chris Brogan? Okay, Chris is a friend of mine and, and he literally gets multiple requests every single day from people saying, I know you don't know me, but could you promote this? Could you tweet this out? And, and why is that? Because they want to borrow his network. But for Chris, what does that mean? He's putting his reputation on the line. So you have to say, why do you share? Not like stuff. Again, liking is a just quick meeting interaction. Uh, sharing something is like saying, hey, I'm going to take you out to La Trois for dinner. It's a lot of money, right? So I, I'm going to really need to know there's a connection with you. So why do people share? And here's a couple of quick reasons. Number one, we share to declare who we are. What we share, again, this is so interesting when you look at psychological and psychographic profiles of people, just look at somebody's timeline and you'll see who they're about and what, they, what they're interested in. It is fascinating. Why can Facebook, why is Facebook worth $220 billion? Anybody know? $220 billion was the latest estimate. Anybody pay money as a user to be on Facebook in here? Anybody pay to be a user as a business on Facebook? If you advertise, right? Why? Why did they do that? Why, why are they worth so much money? Data. data. Exactly right. They have these immensely powerful data markers on every one of us, microseconds of data that can profile us to where after we've liked something up to 300 times, if we, as, as we go through, as, and has everybody heard of Facebook? Right, of course you have. <laughs> now, most of us in here have liked things more than 300 times. Well, after 300 times of liking something, Facebook has a better psychological profile of you than if you went to a counselor on a regular basis. After 70 likes, they know you better than your spouse, which isn't surprising for some people, but you know, if you stop and think about it, they're collecting data. So what we share, on regardless of network, says a lot about who we are. Next, we want to appear smart. We want to be useful. Hey, look at this cool thing I found. I want to share it. I want to help my friends out, but also, as I share things and people say thanks, what does that do? Makes me feel good, right? It actually sets off dopamine in your brain, which is the feel good, a feel good hormone. So you want to share because you want to appear useful and helpful to your friends. A lot of us, and this is a very Midwest trait, why I love being in the, from the Midwest, it's to be generous and, help, and, and kind. So I want to promote a cause, an organization, something that I care about. Another is to grow and nourish relationships. So I want to foster further relationships. I was telling uh, Spencer right before we talked, I, was I, I followed Chris Brogan for a long time. I'm a big fanboy, so it's kind of, he kind of laughs at me. He's like, do I need to get a restraining order when we see each other in person? I'm like, no, 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 no I'm going to take it that far. But, I, but I've, I've been a big fan of his and learned a ton from his for, for years. And the way we connected was about a year ago, and it was through Spartan races and physical fitness. Because he's a dad, I'm a dad. He runs a business, I run a business. And we started saying, well, how do you manage your mental health, your physical health, all of these things while, you know, balancing all of the, all of the stuff in your life? And he said, oh, Spartan races are really cool. So we started sharing content back and forth, and it helped us grow as people, and we started to nourish a relationship. So providing content and, and things that help us grow and, uh, and continue to build current friendships and relationships. And we saw this happen in a negative way, and I'm sure you will see it in a negative way with the upcoming presidential elections. People will see stuff that they don't agree with, somebody's political views, and it used to be, well, I liked Lauren, but I can't believe she likes that person. And so you start to decrease and diminish the value of those relationships. And then last is to show love and support. 
Show that you just care about somebody, something. Uh, people like Mark Schaefer and, and Chris Brogan, Jay Bear, those folks will get people sharing their content without even reading it. Why? Because people love them. They feel connected to them. It's like the Oprah effect. Does that, everybody remember Oprah? Now, I, I admit I loved Oprah, love, love, love Oprah, but one of the things is Oprah doesn't know who I am from a hole in the wall, but I feel like I'm connected with her. I really, you know, it's like Taylor Swift is another great example of this. And why, why do people feel that way? They feel, they, why do they share her stuff? Why do they connect? Because they feel a sense of love and support. So the dilemma that you and I have is this. You guys, including me, when we're on these networks, share for intrinsic reasons, for emotional reasons. But when we put on our business hats, what do we want people to do? We want them to share for economic reasons. Big disconnect. This is pro profound stuff, by the way. That's why I'm pausing. This is extremely important. If you want to be good at social and digital, creating content and sharing content, ask yourself this question every single time. If, it's you, if you would fit into the network of people that are in the audience, say, would I share this? Or if you're not in that network, put yourself in the ideal persona of that network and say, would I share this? And be brutally honest. Because if the answer is no, you're probably pushing for economic reasons only, and you're not pushing for those emotional reasons, again, to get people to share and connect. So important stuff. So what do we do? This is where we can start with some questions. Now I'm gonna buzz through these in the interest of time. You guys will have, have the slides. But let's just start, these are some of the basic questions that I start every client with when we're working on Ignition, that Mark, that we start with the clients um, with Mark, and by the way, you know, we're working with some really, really, really cool uh, clients. Um, so this is the same process that we use, and it's also, it goes in much more depth in the book. But first of all, check, is your own content igniting? One of the ways to check is what types of sharing, liking, uh, um, retweeting, whatever platforms your audience is on, what are, what, what's happening with your content once you create it. Is it like the example I started with? You spent $3 million on content and then there's cricket chir crickets chirping. If that's the case, you have to think about why. Don't beat yourself up and say, oh, we're doing a terrible job. Say, well, what can we do better? As I teach my students in my class, F, I actually, and Lauren was one of my students, and Nate was one of my students, so it was so cool to see you guys up here. But what does F stand for as a student? What does F stand for? Failure. failure. That's a crock. F does not stand for failure. What does F stand for? It stands for feedback. All you're being told is what you're doing isn't working. And if you take that feedback, process that feedback, and do something with it, you can improve. So you don't freak out if you don't do something well. Oh my gosh, my, I looked at my content, I did an honest audit, and nothing's happening. I'm terrible at this. No, you just have been doing the wrong things. Figure out what to do. So you want to look also at your competition. What is it that they're doing? Are they, is their content igniting? If it is, what are some of the things that they're doing and analyze? This is critically important. The next question, if people are sharing, who is sharing? Quick question, for every uh, time a person sees a tweet, how many tweets does it take for them to see before they'll retweet something? So you're looking at your Twitter feed and you see X number of tweets come through. How many tweets does it take before you'll hit a retweet on average? Any guesses, Kristen? Uh, I don't know. 20? Um, you have a guess? Four. Four? Anyone else? 100? 338. 338 on average before somebody will hit the retweet. On Facebook, how often will you get a share? What percentage of your audience will share what you create? Less than 1%. What, what's that? Less than 1%. Boom. Half of a percent will share. These are people who are saying, I love you so much and I care about your content so much, I'm gonna say I identify with it and I'm gonna share it. Are you doing anything to take care of those people? Any type of connection with those people? 
The thing I hate about business in the United States, and this is business in general, is that we're always looking at new acquisition, new acquisition, new acquisition. I've been lucky enough to do some, uh, con have had some conversations with a gentleman named Joey Coleman. If you ever get a chance to look up Joey Coleman, he's amazing. He is the guy who consults with Zappos on customer service. So Zappos is pretty well known. And he has some phenomenal data and he's an amazing storyteller about how you get people to stay connected. Because if somebody signs up with you, chances, on, on whatever it is, chances are within 100 days, if you don't take care of them, they're gone. And they're gone for good. And we're always looking at new acquisitions. Hey, we've got this special offer for new customers. If you're brand new, I love this, with, I'm a US Cellular customer and all the time they're offering these things for, and if you're with US Cellular, come talk to me because I have some things I need some help with. Um, but if you're a new customer, you get this super special deal. And I'll say, well, whoa, 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 wait a second, I've been with you almost 15 years, what do I get? Eh, nothing. So 15 years, I've been paying you, you have me in your pocket, and you're not gonna take care of me. This happens in relationships a lot, by the way, um, is, is you start taking for granted. And so we end up looking for, I need more audience, I need more followers, I need more whatever. No, you don't. Look for the people who are sharing and interacting with you and take care of them. There's tons of ways to do that, but the best way to take care of them is by creating content that they'll continue to share and make sure you're thanking them in some way, shape, or form for sharing. Next, looking at where, why, and how do they share. So what platforms are they on? And making sure that what you're creating is easy, it makes it seamless for them to share what it is that they're doing. I just got to judge um, some categories. The Content Marketing Institute every year has the CMA Award. Does anybody know the Content Marketing Institute, by the way? Great organization, check it out, uh, as far as learning the, some of the cores of content marketing. But the Content Marketing Institute has this CMA award, big event in Cleveland every year, I forget how many people attend, but it's, um, the, the idea is that they look for different businesses that are doing unique things with content. And some of the things that people are doing to make content sharing easy are so simple and so easy to do. Some of them are super innovative that I got to see, but some of the basics we overlook, we take for granted. And by the way, I'm guilty of this sometimes too on my own stuff, so don't feel bad or beat yourself up if you're not doing things perfectly. Next, how do you tap into this audience and succeed? And then how do you enable sharing in every way? Making it easy for people to, to share uh, your, your content. So the content code itself has these six core elements. And these six core elements I'm gonna give you are the foundation. And again, this is a 30,000 foot overview. I wish I could, I could do a full class on this. Um, but 30,000 foot overview, here are six things that you can think about when you think about, okay, I created content or my client's been creating good content and it's not going anywhere, what do we do? First one is brand development. So when you think about brand development, um, you think about brands that you feel deeply connected to. Coca-Cola is a great example. People feel immensely attached to Coca-Cola when really it's nothing more than sugar water with some artificial coloring, right? You know, but you, go, you offer them a Pepsi, you say, you know, I'm sorry we don't have Coke, would you take a Pepsi? No, 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 no. It's like saying, hey Don, do you ever watch a Bears game? No, Bears, who are the Bears? I only watch professional football. Sorry, John. <laughs> So, so thinking of what, what, we, what uh, Mark talks about in the book is building a heroic brand, a brand that people feel so attached to that it's like an Oprah, or it's like a Zappos, or it's like, like for me, Spartan Race. I love Spartan Races. Anything they create, I will share. I feel like I'm part of the community. So step number one is that. Number two is, and this is where I think a lot of gold is. This is where I'm going deep this year, and I think from this point forward, this is where the goal of people who are gonna stand out with digital marketing and content marketing um, and social media marketing are gonna be, is finding people who are your core audience members, what we call your alpha audience, those 2% of people who share your content regularly and taking care of them in a big way. Gary Vaynerchuk, anybody follow Gary Vaynerchuk? Anybody see the little Twitter video he just did on why Twitter video matters? or he did it, it was actually on YouTube. Twitter video, what he does is he now sends shout outs, video shout outs to people who interact with him on Twitter. If you don't know about Gary Vaynerchuk, check him out. You absolutely must be following him. Um, but, and it's at Gary V-E-E. -E. Anyway, what Gary will do is he'll say, hey, Three Rhino Media, thanks a lot for the, the retweet today. Appreciate it, love you, brother. And send that. 
And he does that, these short little video shout outs to people who regularly like and engage with him. You know what people like me do when he does that? Oh my gosh, can you just, oh, he sent me a video. And I hate to admit it, but it's like, it's like fanboying. We all get excited by that. Little thing that builds deeper connections. So finding people, again, who are taking care of you and make sure that they know you're taking care of them. Seth Godin talks about this with tribes as well, is making people feel a part of your community. Next is distribution, advertising, promotion, SEO. None of this stuff goes away. This is just added to. So some people took the content code or the idea of initially of content shock as saying SEO is dead and this is, no, 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 no. This is in addition to, this does not replace any of that. But are you strategically distributing? Quick example, so a person I know created a blog post. The blog post got 7,000 reads. Now for most of us, it's pretty cool, right? person took that same piece of content and distributed it as a slide share, that slide share got 100,000 shares. Same content, exact same content, designed a little bit differently, but different audience. So thinking about how you can strategically distribute, um, share, and repurpose. Building authority, and this is something that takes time. Everybody wants, I've got a client out in California and he always will say to me, and this drives me nuts, he has, we're just, been working with him for a little bit, but he, uh, he has not much content and his whole thing is, I need to be on the front page of Google. Does anybody ever get that? Get me on the front page of Google. Uh, all you have to do, by the way, is use Photoshop, take a screenshot, say, here, here you are. No. <laughs> shh, shh, don't tell anybody I said that. Quick, edit that out, by the way. Um, but the idea is authority matters, but you have to earn authority to be able to do things like uh, have people see you as a thought leader in your community. And one of the things that I would encourage you to do is don't think of big national, international communities. Think of local and niche or niche communities. I always mess up on that word. But um, Next is social proof and social signals. So looking at how is content shared and are you getting enough engagement and shares to, to be visible? So quick example, let's say we're all going out to eat. We all go to, uh, to somewhere in Door County and there's two restaurants that are open. It's all that's open. One restaurant has a line out the door, tons of people are, are sitting down and eating and the parking lot is full. Across the street is another restaurant and nobody's in it even though the lights are on. Which restaurant would you go to? The one with all the people, why? Because it must be good, right? Anybody ever watch SpongeBob? This is like the Krusty Krab and the Chum Bucket, right? The idea being that these signals, we all use these signals as quick markers to make decisions when we see something. Hey, this hasn't been shared very much, therefore it's not very good. Or this person ha doesn't have a big community, so therefore not very good. That's why like when you go to something like Social Media Examiner, you'll see 370,000 people have signed up for our newsletter, you should too. That's social proof. That's saying, hey, we're, it, it, it feeds into things like authority as well. So thinking of how is, how is stuff transmitting through? Yes? Yep, exactly, yep. And, and uh, I'm forgetting the name, maybe it was Abercrombie Fitch, they would, they would pay models to stand out in front of their stores like in New York City and other places because you get good looking, attractive people hanging out. What does everybody want to be? Good looking and attractive and they're gonna go and hang out over there, right? So very, very true in terms of how that works. And last is shareability of content. If there's one thing you take away from today, if I could give you one quick tip that I would absolutely use beyond a shadow of a doubt, it would be this. Work on your headlines. If you have a good headline, there is a 400% chance of you getting more shares. Did you hear that? 400%? Which good headline writing is like doing what? Writing good tweets, right? So you have benefit of, of Twitter, etc. And so as we look at that, if you look at the first letters of each of those, what does it spell? That's right. Y'all are a bunch of badasses now, right? All right, so if you want to be a badass, this is what you have to do. Now in the interest of time, I'm just going to buzz through a couple of quick, quick items in terms of what you can do. And so let me just quick buzz through these. 
Content marketing, uh, excuse me, content code has 22 tips. Here's six quick ones that you can also take to make yourself that digital marketing badass. That's right. It's the only time my kids are like, what did you just say? I'm like, it's business. I had, you know. So number one, make sure you have share buttons. Content that has share buttons is 700% more likely to be shared. It's amazing how many of my clients do not have this. Simple, easy stuff, right? Duh. We know this because it's our arena and our world, but a lot of times, folks, people that we work with don't. Number two is crafting that headline. Uh, by the way, when it comes to crafting headline, list posts get up to 50% more shares on average than non-list posts. I know a lot of people are like, oh, that's, I don't like list posts. Well, people share them because that's the way people work. Uh, next is removing barriers. And this is a challenge. Again, I work with HubSpot, so I'm all about getting lead capturers, stuff like that. But do people really need to register for every piece of content you have? If you're making them register for everything, think of how many people you're losing at the gate who are saying, eh, I'm not ready for this first date. I want, I want a little bit more for free before I give you my contact information. Do you consider a copyright symbol a period? No, not at all. When, when, when you have to enter your information to get, to get content. But should we include copyright, the obvious copyright in our, our uh, materials? That's fine to do, yeah. That's not a barrier. Next is creating joyful content. How many people think there's too much bad news in the world? And I always joke about this, now I'm a dog person, but why are cat and treadmill videos so popular? <laughs> and we know we've all watched one, John Lucas, I'm looking at you, especially when the bears are like, why, why is that? Because we need to laugh more. We need that stuff. So giving people a chance to smile, doing something silly, doing something personal is okay to do. Uh, being visual, BuzzSumo did an analysis of over 100 million articles and what they found was face posts with images get twice as many shares as posts that don't. So again, some of this is bottom line, easy to do. And then last is repurposing your content. As I mentioned, that one blog post got 700 page views when it was repurposed as something for SlideShare, 100,000 views. So. So last but not least, anybody ever read this advertisement? Supposedly from Ernest Shackleton, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. And they got a gazillion, the story goes that he ended up getting a ton of people showing up. Well, that's kind of what marketing is today. It's getting tougher and tougher and tougher. And yeah, it's not life or death, but it is getting tougher. But if you know how to chart where you're going, you can have success. And this still is going to be, in a lot of ways, uncharted territory. We don't know where all of this stuff is going, which I think, for me, is part of what makes it fun. But hopefully these tips and these ideas help you a little bit in terms of thinking about, okay, what is that next step? Once I create content, where is the next place that I need to go? And thinking of how do I ignite my content? How do I engage those people in my community who are really, really, really important to me? What are the little things that I can do to stand out? That really is where the gold of 2015 and beyond is gonna be in the arenas we work with, with digital and content marketing. That's my spiel. So stick around, Don's gonna be here to answer some questions. Uh, wanted to take a moment to thank the staff here. Uh, we had a lot more people show than we expected. We usually have a calculation that we expect a lot of you to hit your snooze button and not come. And it seems like Don was a big draw, so we have a record crowd today.